So, surprise final dungeon. So I have an actual question before we get started with this. Uh Uh-huh. Why does this tower exist? Like, nobody is ever... Like, this is not an area of the game in which anyone is ever intended to actually be in. So... Right. Why... But... Why is there an entirely fully featured, like, challenge dungeon here? That is an excellent question, to which the answer is there is not. There was nothing here. This entire set piece was ad-libbed by Gotham in pretty much the last couple of in-game days. Because Gotham is just like that. But that only makes sense if you assume that Gotham knew what the plan was and therefore had to be like, okay, but we gotta get a dungeon ready for him then. Right. So... And I might observe that Gotham did know what the plan was because Shizuka went and tried to tell him on the fly. Except that him being Gotham, he just started babbling about this magnificent player who managed to break out of his dungeon the first time and how we couldn't wait to do a proper challenge. Shizuka not being uh, Gotham's particular wavelength just thought he was babbling. Really, this whole thing is kind of a mess, but uh, it's working out in our favor. That's a lot of floors. I'm not sure I like where this is going. Yeah, I'm here to reassure you that uh, that elevator header is a gigantic red herring. There are not actually 15 floors in this dungeon. I just getting us out of the way right now. Okay? Okay. So what you're telling me is there are 14 floors. Sure, why not? What I am also telling you is that not only has Gotham ad-libbed an entire final dungeon, he's also invented an entirely new game mechanic. We've got these little elemental floating blobs kicking around, and when we hit them in succession, with shots of the right element, they will grant us elemental invincibility. Also, they move and are subject to gravity and can be kicked around. And, oh right, this is really important. If you hit them with their corresponding element, they will float towards the shot. This is our new thing. Basically, what I'm getting at is that Gotham has been busy in these last couple days, because, uh... Well... I don't know if you picked up on this, but Gotham is really, really into game design. Gotham is maybe a little bit too into game design. Yeah. Anyway, not only has Gotham invented an entirely new dungeon element, he's also brought back all of the old ones. And they're going to be interacting with our new ones in uh, interesting and fun ways, so look forward to that. I cannot stress enough how much he just wants us to enjoy this. Really though, this this whole thing in which Crossworlds itself doesn't actually have a final dungeon yet because it's still in early access and they're working on it Instatainment are busy plugging away doing their thing it's not ready yet, please be patient and yet Gotham threw this thing together in like a couple days Admittedly, he reused a bunch of stuff, like the Vermilion Tower was all there. The whole, the whole deal with this area is that it was a, it was done development. Well, partially done development for a while, and then they dropped it. And then it got reappropriated by uh, Sidwell and friends. So there's stuff here to work with, but still... 
he made an entire dungeon. So I gotta wonder, are, are we supposed to take it from this that uh, Instertainment are just slacking? I'm not really sure what the takeaway from this is supposed to be. I mean, I guess to be to be fair, it is much easier to throw together anything. Like when you like in the sense that like Instatainment theoretically has to put together this dungeon that is appropriate for anyone who would happen to make it in and you know, you gotta make it story, you gotta make it, like, thematically similar for story purposes and yada yada yada. Whereas Gotham is essentially a Kaizo ROM hacker and just gets to be like, alright bitch, you're in my world now. Ah, more of a rogue modder than a rogue game designer. Although, why not both? I will grant that for how original the puzzle work here is, the actual elements themselves, like the, the design elements, are not that rich, really. Like, look, look at this thing. It's it's a turret. It just sits here shooting shots at us. Well, I mean, yeah. And it's invincible. Well, and no. then it dies immediately. Well, I mean, yeah, that makes sense. Gotham's a level designer for the He's not an enemy designer. Although, remember that time he put together a boss fight for us? Again, entirely... Entirely ad-lib. Did he really, though? Because I feel like he basically took, like, some rando enemy, like, increased its size modifier by, like, 10, and then we're like, okay, but what if I gave it 11 billion hit points? Hmm. No, I meant the, I meant the fight with himself. I don't know what the hell is to deal with Gastropolis. But he he made he did that whole fight in Bergen Trail, and that was a whole thing. That was a well put together boss fight. Admittedly, he eventually stopped fucking around and just captured us. But like that's because that whole thing was basically just him fucking around in his spare time. Like I trying to process this character as a character in this game is kind of an exercise in thematic insanity. I... You, eventually you'll, you'll always hear me say at some point, any time I get to talking about video games, that games eventually turn into a conversation between the player and the developer, one way or another. And sometimes this is a literal observation and sometimes it's a figurative one, but it... it's pretty consistent. We do this whole dance, where they put this stuff here for us, and we go through it, we figure it out. And then here's CrossCode, which gives us, in the closing hours of its plot, literally being challenged to clear a, a bespoke dungeon by a slightly unhinged game designer who just wants to create the ultimate experience. Just once. How much do we dare read into this? I remind you that something like... Six years? Passed? Between the original CrossCode Proof of Concept and the release of version 1 of the game. They did the whole early access chapters thing. Like you can't you can't tell me. You can't tell me there's no subtext here. What is any of this? If not just us indulging the whims of a game designer over and over again. I guess I should note we're given to believe that Gotham is also mostly responsible for all of the rest of the... Well, pretty much the whole entire design of Crossworlds, generally. That was before, you know, all that stuff happened, but still. 
that would track that he he was pro he was probably the, the the head level designer. So we gotta wonder, right? How much of the oh, by the way, this 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 one fight in particular is just kind of a mess because he gets completely busted by Chill. Like his attacks just become useless. Ah, chill. You mean the thing that is inflicted by every single art of his weakness? Actually, not all of them. It's one of the the balancing aspects of the different texts is that only some of them inflict chill. But your regular attack and your your regular shot always do it, but only some of the texts do it. But Eternal Winter, etc., absolutely do do that. So. Mm. So, yeah, we're to believe that Gotham has been uh, restricted all this time in what he was able to create, and only now has true creative freedom, now that he's, like, technically stuck working for Sidwell but now staging a rebellion. And with that freedom, he put together this, in a tiny amount of time. Like, it's fascinating, right? But yeah, as, as you've observed, he has not had the opportunity to create many new encounters. These are still just the standard Vermilion Wasteland monsters. The only new thing in here so far has been the turrets, which are a uh, not very interesting. I mean, they're also not really an enemy, they're just an environmental hazard, which is something that seems like it would be up in his wheelhouse. There is that. I mean, it's, it's an enemy in the sense that it's a game entity that has hit points that you have to reduce to zero, but... Hmm. We'll get to... Uh, Gotham and combat design, eventually. I guess the other thing I should probably note is that for our lead game designer who's finally attained true creative freedom, the actual layout of Vermilion Tower is not very imaginative. It's just... it's a couple of puzzle rooms in sequence is all it is. The puzzles themselves are pretty great. Gotta respect him for that, but... It's not... it's just a couple puzzles in sequence, really. This whole thing seems strangely both impressive and underwhelming at the same time in different respects. Which, again, is probably pretty appropriate, given that this is basically just an on-the-fly mod. I also have to wonder how much of this stuff was proposed. Like, whether, th whether this was, like... Whether not only this stuff, but, like, stuff in Vermilion Wastelands was cut for any particular reason that's of any significance. They've, they were pretty clear about Vermilion Wasteland was cut from the game. But we never find out exactly why, it's just the fact that it's cut content is what made it suitable for Sidwell's plan. But we never actually figure out how it was ever going to factor into Crossworlds. It is kind of out of nowhere. Like... There doesn't seem like there would be much reason to ever come here in terms of Crossworlds lore. Right, but they could put stuff here. Like the whole the whole notion was that it's unfinished. It doesn't have it doesn't have any lore purpose. It doesn't have any dungeons, it doesn't have any connection to the track of the ancients. But like 
They could have written all that stuff. I mean, it's not like any of these other places are that significant for any reason other than they are where the buildings that contain the dungeons are. And then you go through the dungeon and one of the gods tells you that every step has formed the path of your growth. And that's the plot. So... I don't think it's that important, really. They could have put stuff here. And also, this is the same game that literally had us take a tram line directly from the ice place to the desert. So uh, I don't think they were that concerned about a sensible environment design from a realism perspective, either. So, I don't know. There's only so much that we can, uh, we can reason about this stuff. I mean, broadly, like, Vermilion Wasteland doesn't really fit in with anything else in Crossworlds. I mean, that's true. It's kind of a jarring disconnect aesthetic-wise as well. All of the other places are just, like, they're just standard-issue RPG biomes, really. You, you got you got your nice welcoming forest place and your slightly less welcoming forest place. You got your icy mountain. You got your fiery desert. You got your big jungle. Sapphire Ridge is kind of an outlier, but that's like it still works as a place. It's just Sapphire Ridge is like the the nice art final area. That's like wow, what a cool area. They had to hold something back to put at the end. And Vermilion Wasteland is just like, yeah. This place is red and it's ugly. Not really a, a whole lot to work with there. So yeah, I mean, we can probably make a pretty good educated guesses at a bunch of this stuff, but... I'm just saying, none of it, none of it ever really comes up, and it doesn't help very much trying to figure out exactly what was the level design deal at Instatainment before, during, and after Gotham's period in like actually officially being in charge. Another question: Who is the art director for for Instatainment? Right. Have we have we met them at all? Or is this, or you know, is this also Gotham kind of doing things on the fly? Right, because level design and world design and art design are all like quite disparate processes. You can build a lot of stuff in a game before you have any real idea what it looks like, and you can. There are entire essays to be written just about the specific use of color, let alone like any kind of art direction. So, you have to assume that there's all kinds of stuff going on, but, uh, I guess the writers of CrossCode just thought that they wasn't. We, as players and consumers, are not ready for that conversation. It's all just game design. And I can kind of understand why they chose not to complicate the internal lore of Crossworlds with, uh, the distinctions of level design and art design and art direction and, and colour. And uh Wow, here's another one. What about what about the music? Does Crosswells have music? Does Entertainment have a composer? We're hearing all this BGM all the time. Like, who's actually writing that? This dungeon has its own theme. Like, are we are we to believe that all the other music in the game has been officially composed for Crosswells, but Gotham's just done this one on the fly? I feel like it might somehow be kind of on brand for him to have done that. Yeah, like I, I imagine that there is an actual co there uh, there must be an actual composer in house somewhere in entertainment to handle the like the main game. But, like, this is almost certainly not being handled in that way. 
Honestly, my money is that if this track, if it if it truly does exist somewhere in Crosscode, is or Crossworld, is probably an unused or cut track somehow. I mean, Vermilion Wasteland had its own theme, and so did the the first version of Vermilion Tower. But of course, Vermilion Tower quickly kind of went off the rails the last time we were here, so uh, hmm. I feel like our capacity to read into that is a little bit limited. This shot is unbelievably tedious, by the way. It's not even anything to this, you just have to hit that thing from two sides at the same time. I hate it. But yeah, that's... It once again comes down to, we've just got an unbelievably talented rogue game designer who's decided to make a stand. He just wants one shot at making the ultimate experience. He doesn't care about any of this, any of this other stuff. But an opportunity has arisen and we're gonna deal with it. Gotta wonder what Sidwell's actually thinking at this point, though. Does Sidwell even have any power to do anything at this point? Well, no. That's why this is going on at all. Well, no, I, I mean more from the sense of, like, okay, so he's been betrayed by Gotham and been you know, Leia goes into the tower to do all these things. And the server has crashed, so he can't really do anything with regards to that. But surely, surely he has every opportunity at this point to basically fuck with and otherwise hurt every other person involved in this? Like, like surely he, he, should, he would be doing something to say... Emily and, you know, all the others that are currently outside and just, like, is everybody just standing around and going, oh, you know what? I sure hope Leia pulls this off. I mean, yeah, because what what exactly is, is Sidwell even going to do to any of them? Like, none of them are involved in this. This whole thing is, is all Gotham and Leia. Well, this! But, like, everything yeah, like, going the on The rest of outside. them are, are outside. But, like, what's the point? Leah's in the tower. Leah's the one who's got to get to the server. The others are basically finished at this point. They got nothing else to do other than sit and wait. And, like, there would be no point in interfering with them. I don't know. I think it would be pretty... I would be... I would actually be more surprised he didn't... He wouldn't take the opportunity to go for, like, some kind of hostage situation. Like, oh, you did! Good job, Leia. You climbed the tower, you you won the challenge. You're so great. Unfortunately, I have all of your friends under my control, and if you don't get and if you don't reboot that server and get the hell out of there, they're all going to cease to exist. Right, well I feel like for him to do that would require a whole bunch of logistical operations on his part. Like, that's like seven people IRL. So he would have to be able to get to any or all of those people, IRL. Now, maybe we're to believe that he's secretly got an army or something working for him, that he would be able to just do that, and that's even if he, if he does actually know any of these people. I guess he would at least possibly know about Lucas, because there's the Evotar Lucas, but... It's a whole operation, and none of it matters if he can't get the server back. I mean, at the very least, though, all of their avatars are right outside, and this dude has clearly shown that he has the ability to, if not affect the game as directly as Gotham does, like, he still can do things. I mean, what's, what's, he, what's he gonna do? Remove their avatars from the wasteland? Like, what would be- again, I keep coming back to this, what would be the point? 
there's nothing that he can change by messing with anybody's avatars. They would all just log off. And that would be the end of that. This whole thing is basically, Gotham has got him in a spot. Because the server is down, the server is what all of this rests on. And the plan always was, and I'm pretty sure Simwell has figured out that the plan is for Leah to get to the server. Nobody else can do it. Nothing else matters. So he's just... He just doesn't really have any alternative except to watch this play out, or try and reboot the server. And in the meantime, all he, all he can think is like, Jesus Christ, Gotham, on your bullshit. It's certainly very entertaining, as a reader, to see all that play out. Well, I wasn't ex I wasn't sure what this thing was, but now I see. We, we are fighting a literal RNG octopus. Yes. It's in fact I I believe we mentioned before its name is literally RNG. It's not like the letters RNG. It's like a word. It's like A R E N G E. So it's it's okay. Is what I'm saying. But yeah, it rolls a dice to do attacks, and it does different attacks depending on the roll. And it kind of has a sequence. It's random-ish. It's got all these patterns like it'll roll a 6, which makes it do all of its ultimate attacks, and then it will immediately roll a 5, which makes it vulnerable. But sometimes it can roll a 5 at random, so... Hmm. Anyway, sure, why not? Four turrets at once. Except... We never actually fight four turrets at once. So this is a weird encounter. Also, I cannot get the timing of the shot shots down, so uh, ate a lot of shit there. But yeah, this is not so much a boss as a weird extended encounter. We've got all four of these turrets here, and as it happens, we're only actually going to fight each one once. Except for the ice one at 12 o'clock, which we're going to fight twice. Other than that, there's not... Like, there's not really anything to this. It's just some stuff in our way. Like you said, well, like you said, you know, Gotham's not a combat designer. He's a level designer. And, frankly, it shows. Hmm. Yeah. I wonder what we, what we could have had if he'd have had more time. Because, again, we're, we're to believe that he is basically also the designer of all the other dungeons, which have been uh, variously involved and, and convoluted and lengthy and environmentally and artistically and narratively integrated. They were these whole productions. So I'd like to think that if we'd have, if we'd have had even more time, that we could have had something else. But, hmm. The thing about this place is, though, that, like, like I said, for all the simplicity to its actual layout, the actual stuff in here is very good. Like these puzzles, we... I, I don't, I don't know how obvious it's, it's going to be to casual viewers when we've been talking about the, the wider world of Gotham and game design on top of all this. But the puzzles in this place are not fucking around. They are like it's, it's just even more peak crosscode. This is Gotham has finally found another way to elevate this whole thing even higher. And I love them. They're interesting and imaginative, and they involve both shiny new things and interesting integrations of the old things. They're great. They're really good.
and I just don't really have anything to follow that up with. What what even happened here? He was just designing stuff, and then he realised that. Hang on. Anyway, this is the final boss. Like, don't get me wrong, there's gonna be an, an enemy encounter after this, and we're gonna have to reduce its hit points to zero to beat the game, but don't... don't get this wrong, okay? This... this is the final boss of CrossCode. This whole production right here. There are a lot of pieces in this room. Just sit and gaze at it for a minute, and bask in its splendor. I genuinely don't even know where to start with this. I mean, that's the beauty of these things, that where to start is pretty straightforwardly signposted. We fire a shot into the thing that makes it move, and then we babysit it around the room. It's just that the room is enormous, and involves more or less all the elements. And the irony is that... Well, I mean, one of the ironies is that I messed up literally the first piece of this. But the actual irony is that for all of its uh, overwhelming uh, presence, this whole thing is actually pretty straightforward. Like, there's, it's not really much of a puzzle. It's just... You've got to learn a little sequence, and then you have to input it with the correct timing. That's really it. You can uh, you can figure out most of what you have to do here without even like really getting too involved. Really, this whole thing is just it's just timing and practice. It's still evil. I mean, don't get me wrong, I can sympathize a great deal with people who are like, okay, this this puzzle right here is too much. But uh I don't know. I am honestly a huge fan of this. This bit in particular, that one icicle there, is great. It's one of my favourite one of interactions in one of these puzzles anywhere in the game. Anyway, here I messed that one up because I accidentally hit the teleporter and stepped off the button. If you don't do that, the timing here is actually incredibly generous. And that's another thing about this, that the, the timing involved on these things, most of them are actually fairly generous. There aren't very many of them that you only have like a, a second to shoot the thing. None of the shots are very precise. Most of these is you just have to hit something once from any direction in order to get it to work. This bit at the, the very south of the room, where we have to light up all of the, the torches with one bouncing fire shot, is probably, like, aiming-wise, the most difficult shot you have to make in here. The rest of this is just... It's oddly manageable for how overwhelming it seems at first glance. And that's it. We beat the game. So, like, can we unpack this a little bit? I'm trying to figure out what exactly Gotham is sad about here. Like he said that, oh, we, I, I made the ultimate experience, but then I realised that we didn't have a player to enjoy it. Then he also says that he's been creating all these other experiences, but all of the players walking through them are lifeless, somehow. So 
so I get the sense that he's talking about two different things for one. Like, he's saying that on the one hand, he's bored of the regular level design in Crossworlds and thinks that it's become routine and that people aren't enjoying it enough, which, uh, well, okay. And also, he's, he seems to be saying that he's been, like, tinkering with ultimate dungeon design in his spare time, but it doesn't matter because nobody can play them, so he can't derive any joy from the fact that he's made all of these incredible dungeons. Like, maybe this wasn't ad-libbed. So he might have had this thing lying around on his uh, computer for years while he was officially working on the, the other main Crossworlds dungeon. Or while he was working for Sidwell. And just and then just had the perfect opportunity to whip out one of his old specials. Yeah, it's a little tricky to get a handle on. It, he definitely says we. I mean, it's kind of a a weird one because it happens in one of those cutaways that's like between uh, Leah Dream and gameplay resuming. But we we literally do see him right after he finishes it. And like, yes, finally, I've done it. The ultimate creation. So, some of the work done on this thing has to have been very recent. But yeah, also, it's not uh, impossible that he's had this thing cooking for a while. Really, though, the important thing is that, once again, this all comes down to one desperate game designer just wanting to do one good game design, even if only one person on Earth gets to enjoy it. There's just something about this premise that speaks to me. It's like games have gone meta before, and games have explored these same ideas before, but something about this particular permutation of these ideas seems somehow more satisfying than all the other times I can think of that anyone's done this. And I'm not entirely sure why. I'm sure we're going to hear a lot of opinions on the subject, though. Well, anyway, here we are. We climb the tower. And I guess we're on our way to kill God. <laughs> 